Awesome. Thank you so much, Sunil. All right, next up we have uh, Sarah Nadell, uh, co-founder and chief science officer at Stellar Employ, an SAP.io foundry company that helps labor-intensive businesses make great hiring decisions at scale. Sarah has a very impressive background. She studied statistics and economic development at Harvard Kennedy School, where she received her PhD. Uh, she has 10 years of experience in operations and applied research in international development and holds a BA with honors from Stanford University. Please welcome Sarah. Hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you a little bit about Stellar Employ. As Lauren mentioned, Stellar Employ is a platform that services enterprises that hire large volumes of workers for the same job. Typically, these are what we might consider frontline or hourly jobs, things like call centers, hospitality, et cetera. And we're able to improve those enterprises' hiring outcomes by using data to help them identify their best fit employees. So really taking advantage of the large volume there. Now, uh, we're in an elite university. I'm sure everyone here is very well educated. So before I talk to you about our platform itself, I'd like to take a moment and really walk you through the process, the challenge, and the population that we're working with. So if you bear with me for a second, just take a moment and imagine you've just finished high school. You're not going to be applying to a four-year university, so you're looking for your first full-time job. And given your educational background, you know, this best-case scenario is going to be something like a distribution center, maybe a restaurant, maybe a call center, something that pays at best $20 an hour. And the good news is that this actually describes about 40% of jobs in the US today, so you have a lot to choose from. So where do you start your search? You'll probably begin by looking at the jobs where your friends and family work, where they can say good things about those employers. And then maybe you'll grow and you'll apply to jobs that are being offered by the businesses around you that are hiring very aggressively. And then maybe um, you will just apply opportunistically at the places that are near your home and easy to get to. And then you'll get that first job offer and congratulations. You will almost definitely accept that offer without thinking a second thought or asking any questions about it. But 90 days later, you will, with a 50% probability, not be at that job anymore. And you will have returned to this process of applying to jobs, waiting for interviews, going through background checks. Only this time, now you are answering questions about why you left that first job so quickly. It will take you an average of 12 weeks to get another job. So on the co contrary, imagine if you stay. Imagine if you get into the rhythm of working, you really settle in, and within about six months or a year, you get a small promotion, a little bit of a raise, and then you get another and another. And within maybe 10 years, you're in a managerial role and you're in a salaried position. And you've really climbed up that professional ladder. That happens as well. So what's the difference? between the people who climb up that professional ladder and the people who end up stuck in this cycle of job insecurity and um, low wages. There are a lot of differences, certainly. But one of the things that we really focus on at Stellar Employee and that we found to be quite predictive is, surprise, whether or not you like the job. And for those of us who work in the professional sphere, it's both intuitive and obvious that job fit is a huge determinant of success. But we don't often realize that that's also the case for our frontline employees. And to give you an example, take two jobs that many of us will be somewhat familiar with. Um, someone who really excels at Dunkin' Donuts turns out to be incredibly good at attention to detail. Because they're sitting there, they're getting that cream and sugar right every single time. They're grabbing the right bagel or donut. But at Burger King, someone who does really well is totally different. They're very, very good at multitasking. They're coordinating across five different workstations. There's a really long menu list, and things can get incredibly um, hectic during meal times. So now we're talking about two really, really similar jobs, we might think from the outset, fast food, but they actually have totally different profiles. And understanding the difference between those profiles turns out to be important. Because if a great Burger King employee gets their first job offer instead at Dunkin' Donuts, they become 30% 
more likely to leave in that first 90-day window. And this is expensive. It's expensive for them. On average, it costs hourly workers about $3,000 a year. And since we're talking about a 60 million, uh, sorry, 60 million person labor force, this is a $180 billion problem. And it's expensive for corporations as well. On average, Burger King franchisees are spending $5 million every single day managing turnover. And frankly, it's expensive for us as a society. These are the people who pack our Amazon orders. They answer our customer service calls and they make that crucial morning latte. And so selfishly, don't we also want the people in those jobs to be successful, to be well-placed? So for most of society, we've come to believe that this is just the nature of the job. It's something that we're going to deal with. But today, I'd really like to argue that with advances in AI and data science and behavioral science as well, there's an opportunity to improve hiring outcomes and improve employment outcomes and place people in jobs where they are more likely to excel. So as Lauren mentioned, I studied behavioral science and statistical analysis. And I started looking at this problem while I was completing my PhD. And I was really surprised to find that Success in hourly jobs comes down to a limited number of traits. Things like attention to detail, preference for working in teams, motivation. And once we map out these traits, we can learn which of these traits are more or less relevant for which jobs. And then we can identify who's more likely to excel in what jobs. And so that's what we do at Stellar Employ. We take advantage of the large amount of data that's generated by these high volume jobs to learn who is more likely to excel where at a very granular level. And we're able to improve hiring outcomes in that way by about 30%. So if we go back to that opening question, um, now imagine that you're that high school grad looking for a job. And instead of being asked questions about your prison record or having your ethnicity assessed, now you're being asked questions in that interview about what makes you tick. What do you like? And if you're applying for a job through Stellar Employee, and I'll show you that process in a minute, you're actually just answering 15 minutes of questions about yourself. And then you're immediately able to schedule an interview with the jobs where you are most likely to excel, putting you on that path to career success. So now you're in a job where you're happy, stable, and productive. And you're also in a world where you're valued, engaged, and validated by society. So that's what we're working towards here at Stellar Employee. And I'd like to start by talking you through our applicant survey. So our applicant survey, again, we're working with the 40% of jobs that pay about $20 or less per hour. This is not the most tech savvy population of the entire United States. Um, we are mobile friendly, which is how most of our applicants access the internet. And for those of you who thought 15 minute survey, oh my god, like I didn't even you know, download the app for this conference because I thought it was going to be a pain in the butt. I'm going to show you how we make this really, really easy. Um, so the first thing is that we emphasize as soon as an applicant clicks on their um, interest to apply to a job, the first thing they do is that we're emphasizing that we want to learn about them. We're not using terms like questionnaire. We're not using terms like test. This is obviously a population um, that is not academically inclined um, or hasn't had that opportunity. But uh, we really want to emphasize that this is about getting to know them, the humanity of the job. And then we start with fast and engaging questions. Our applicants are able to get through these really quickly. And as they start moving, they become more and more invested in the survey. We also have designed a survey that has very low language requirements. We're working with a population that may have low literacy or may not be native English speakers. So in this case, this is one of our social comprehension questions. And we're including a video rather than an extensive written example which you often see for EQ, and it's silent. So there's no requirement to understand speaking. And then the other thing that we do is that there's really no right answer. This is a preference question. Every single one of these answers identifies something that this person will be good at. And again, I'd like to emphasize, because we're all academics, or you, many of you are academics, this is through data. This isn't something that we're making up, right? So we've identified that people who choose option A, the way they can help their families by making sure they have very little to worry about. These are people who are achievement oriented. And they're going to choose jobs that really emphasize professional growth or promotional opportunities. 
The second option, sharing with my family the most important moments in life. These are people who are real worker bees, so they like that fixed schedule, so they can organize, for example, birthday parties around when their schedule is going to be. They know they can be home, um, if not Christmas Day, they know they can be home to celebrate Christmas on the 26th or the 27th. Being with my family as much as possible, these are your work-life balance people. We've noticed, incidentally, that the people who do well in these jobs often prefer fewer work days and longer shifts. So they're balancing out child care, maybe elderly parent care with family members. And then supporting them economically, these are the people who will always go for that highest paying job. We also have tiered answers to buffer misrepresentation. By the way, I have achieved something that took years of work. Both being very high on that scale and very low on that scale makes you a good employee for some of these jobs for, that we fill. But what we see is that people exaggerate a little bit in either direction. So even with kind of the typical um, maybe conscious misrepresentation or misrepresentation to yourself, we're still getting really valuable information. Um, and then as soon as the applicants are done, we tell them a little bit about what we learned about them. So they're able to walk away with true information that they can use in their job search whether or not they end up getting a job through Stellar Employ. And at the close of this, they can reserve interviews at jobs where they're more likely to excel. So I'm going to go quickly through. We have about 30% improvement in turnover in the first four months. This is a true client of ours. This is a call center. And our clients, the enterprises that pay us to use our platform, also experience benefits aside from the direct financial benefits, which is that they can double their hiring capacity through the platform that services them. We do things like we integrate with payroll systems like SAT. We integrate with uh, job announcement platforms like Indeed. We have bulk communication processing. Um, and we also have visuals that allow them to track their progress because they're incented on filling a certain number of seats every week. So here's a funnel view. This is what our talent acquisition managers are able to see so they can compare how many people have applied, who's been hired, what's their progress, they can compare across locations. We found that a lot of HR teams at distributed organizations have a little bit of friendly competition across locations, so we like to encourage that. Again, able to track their progress, which I mentioned. And then this is how we share the actual outcomes of the survey. So applicants are, um, if you click into their profile, you can see what they're good at. Joey's great at getting things done. And then you can hover over the More button and you can see how important that is for the job. So we're also working very hard to share with our talent acquisition experts why we're recommending certain people for the job and what that means. We're giving them data to empower them to do their job well. And that's a really big difference in making decisions for them, although we are prioritizing great fit applicants for interviews. So in this way, we've been able to double hiring volume. This is a true information from one of our clients, Home Chef, meal kit delivery company owned by Kroger, the largest employer, third largest employer in the US. And um, to bring it back to the kind of the future of digital platforms, Jimmy Holleran, who's the head of special projects there, this is his description of us. Hiring, the way it's done historically, just doesn't make sense. Why are we going through resume after resume after resume when we know that the information there is not predictive of success? Why are we spending time doing that? Why are we spending time trying to get people on the phone? 50% of recruiter time is currently spent trying to get people on the phone. Let's get rid of that. Let's take advantage of AI. Let's discover what truly is determinant of success and move people through the application process quickly. And that's what Stellar Employee does. So I've got two minutes left. Would love to take questions. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I have a question on the, on the, on the employee side. Yeah. So to the extent that obviously human beings aren't fixed, um, what do you do to empower them in terms of adapting new skills, uh, advancing you know, um, to other jobs that, that, you know, that they could uh, have? The one facility that we currently have right now is um, our, our clients will often use us to flag people with promotional potential, and then they will invest in those people. 
But we are, um, so again, uh, early stage company, but something that we do have on the horizon is that we're developing relationships with really great professional training organizations that would like to use our product to help not just identify people with promotion potential, but direct them to the right promotion within them. Um, this is also relevant today with you see, when you see a lot of retraining going on in large corporations where certain types of jobs are just being sunsetted, but they want to hold on to that staff. Okay, that was my only question. Um, send me an email. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. And again, if you guys do have additional questions for um, some of these startup founders, uh, they'll be available for the at the table talks after this session. So um, with that, we have our, our last uh, startup presenter here. Uh, Joseph Borello is CTO at Biosapien. It's a biotech company developing novel biodegradable implantable products that deliver active pharmaceutical ingredients for oncology and anti-inflammatory therapies or indications. Uh, Joe is a biomedical engineer and PhD candidate at Mount Sinai, uh, working in two different labs, in addition to managing digital fabrication operations within the Sinai Biodesign Innovation Team. Joe has an entrepreneurial streak, uh, founding two startups in medical imaging and 3D printing industries. Joe received a degree in biomedical engineering from Macaulay uh, Honors College at the City College of New York. He's a very busy guy. Uh, I'll introduce Joe. The over there. All right. Is this going? Cool. Yes, very different from, I think, everything else you guys have heard today. And I'm, you might be wondering, how is this even a platform? Um, so to just kind of paraphrase the, the little description on this slide, what Biosapien does is 3D prints uh, implants that release drugs into the body. And it turns out that this is something that um, is, is pretty extensible and is not just your typical you make a drug and release it, and it's a, you know, a kind of linear pathway to market, um, as most biotech innovations are. And so what we do is, is kind of based on the idea that diseases begin locally. Uh, before a cancer turns metastatic, it begins in your lungs or in your pancreas. And before um, a hormonal disease can impact your entire body, it starts with a dysfunction in your pituitary gland or your thyroid gland. Um, and even infections, you know, they begin with a cut before they become systemic and impact your entire body. Um, in a lot of cases, though, treatments are given systemically. You can think about chemotherapy for cancer uh, and, and systemic hormone therapy for the body. Um, and in some cases, this is done uh, not just because it's you know, the only way to do it, but because patients are uh, refusing more invasive surgeries that can go and you know, treat these local sim symptoms before they spread to the entire body. Um, and so we thought there had to be a better way, some other approach to treat these local diseases before it got out of hand. Uh, and so we came up with the MedChip, which is a 3D printed polymer scaffold that we can load up with a therapeutic agent, be it a chemotherapy drug or a, um, a hormone or a biologic, and we implant it in the body near the, the region of interest. And then this thing will slowly degrade over time. Uh, releasing the, the drug in the area of interest and you know treating the disease. And so it's this chip itself is a platform because we've, we're printing a kind of base. It's a scaffolding one could think of as you build a building and then we put into the scaffolding drugs of choice. And so the first indication we're going after is cancer and so there's a drug that's already been approved for 3D printing and so that's really great for us. We don't have to jump through the normal regulatory hurdles of getting that whole process approved. We can just kind of print our design and go for it. Um, but down the road, the idea is that you, we don't just use this to treat cancer, um, you know, one kind of cancer, even there's many different treatments and different drugs used for different cancers, but we can jump over to pain medications, we can jump over to hormone deficiencies, uh, we can go to anti-inflammatives uh, and anti-infectious agents to treat local injuries. Um, and we can kind of modulate all of these behaviors by adjusting the polymers that we're, we're kind of putting into this mix. It's almost like baking a layer cake um, where you have different you know, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and things like that, except in this case, it's materials that degrade at different rates and can release one or more therapeutic agents at different rates. So it's a very it's a customizable, very easily tailored platform for uh, not only different drugs, but also different treatment regimens. 
And all of that's possible because it's so easy to make this with 3D printing. And so what we end up getting here is something that is giving the same dosage to an, air, you know, an area of interest that you'd be getting with a systemic IV, except it's not hitting all these other tissues that had nothing wrong with them. If you think about all the side effects of chemotherapy or of a hormone therapy, because it's affecting tissues in your body that don't need that intervention, but we need to get you know, the tumor, and so we have to bombard you with chemotherapeutic drugs. And so you lose your hair, you get develops illnesses, your white blood cell count drops, all these bad side effects that require a lot of, of input in the hospital system to keep you alive, essentially, while we try to save your life. And so this gives you the same dosage in the tissue of interest without all of that extra stuff. It, it reduces the labor that goes into the kind of the maintenance of a treatment regimen. It makes it easier to uh, deliver treatment. Uh, it, it, the targeting becomes easier. It, it's easier for us to uh, get compliance this way. And so instead of opting for an inva only an invasive surgery or opting for a rough chemotherapeutic regimen, you can take this third option and say, I would like this thing you know, implanted in a less invasive surgery where we don't have to resect anything. We're just going to put it next to this initial tumor that we have found and let it do its thing over the course of anywhere between a few months to a few years. Um, in the case of cancer, it would probably be on the lower end. In the case of hormones, it would probably be the higher end. But again, all that is tunable because we can adjust the, the material properties of the, of the, the chip that we're printing. Uh, and so kind of briefly the, the science behind what we're doing here is that the notion of implanting polymer scaffolds in the body isn't new to deliver drugs. And most of them use either PLGA or PEG, which are just two molecules that are biocompatible and de degrade and or interact with tissues in the body. It turns out that in a lot of disease environments, though, the common molecules that you use end up uh, behaving differently than they do in a lab setting. And so in cancer environments, uh, PLGA will release drug too quickly. And so you get a kind of an, an overdose locally that might kill the tumor cell, but it'll also damage the surrounding tissues. Um, PEG is a molecule that likes water. And so when you try to get something to pass the cell membrane, which is made up of a fat layer, it, it kind of freaks out and releases things in the wrong place. And so our, our compound, our polymer is kind of our sauce that we've, we've applied to this, this technique. And it is uh, both friendly to and not friendly to water, which makes it, depending on which side you kind of adapt, you can deploy it in a lot more places. It's got a much more predictable release profile of therapeutics. And it can last a lot longer in the body because it's more stable in these more dramatically different environments. Uh, these are some of the people working in the space. Some of these companies are doing the uh, PLGA and PEG scaffolds. Some of them are doing nanotherapeutic approaches where you've got a nanoparticle and try to target it so that it reaches uh, you know, key cells in the body. That doesn't always, that, well, it hasn't worked yet. That's one of those things that people say is uh, great, to, great in the lab and never gets out. Um, but essentially what we're offering here is the capacity to make a more adaptable, extensible platform for, for therapeutic delivery. And I, I don't want to go too much more into the, the regulatory aspect of how we're going to bring this thing through, because there's a lot of just letters and alphabet soup involved. But essentially, the idea is this can come to market easily because we're using known drug compounds. We're not inventing any new drugs. We're just putting them in a new delivery mechanism, which is made of materials that are also approved. And so we really just have to show that this compound and this, this chip is delivering what we say it's going to deliver in living systems. And so we're in the process of doing the, the, the bench tests to tr translate that over to the, the living tests right now. Um, so what I would want to talk about for the rest of this, this session is kind of the idea of physical digital platforms, which sounds really counterintuitive, but I promise you it, it makes sense. It's the idea that just like we can build these systems that then third parties can come on and do their own thing on top of build their own applications and their own uh, uh, services. The same thing applies in, in the physical hardware domain. We have things like bioprinters and regular 3D printers now. 
um, that can layer and add different materials together in all kinds of combinations of ways. There's an infinite number of geometries that you can use that may or may not be functional for your application. And a 3D printer or a digital computerized laser cutter or a milling machine can produce all of these geometries. And it's really, you know, no one person is going to figure out every single thing that can be done with any of these devices. It's, they exist as tools, just like a hammer or a wrench is a tool, and you can come up with all kinds of crazy ways to use hammers and wrenches. And if you don't believe me, follow some machine shops on Instagram. Um, and the idea behind these computerized technologies is that humans have been layering things together and cutting things up for as long as we've existed, but we're not so good at making highly ordered and structured patterns. And it's these ordered and structured patterns that are so crucial to what we're doing at BioSapien and what a lot of other technologies are capable of. It's the ability to cut highly patterned parallel uh, cuts into a piece of wood that give it the ability to become as flexible as a piece of rubber. Um, when normally it's rigid and it'll break if you try to bend it like that. It's the ability to take two or more different uh, polymer materials, layer them together in such a way that when you put it in water of a hot temperature, it contracts up and you form a four-dimensional printed soft robot. Uh, and there's nothing special about any of these materials. Like this is just plain old maple. And this, I actually don't know what materials they are, but I promise you they're conventional <laughs> plastics. Um, there's nothing special. Nobody invented any new woods or new plastics to do either of these applications. They just created a new way to combine the two of them, and they did this through 3D printing and laser cutting that mediated by a computer. And this kind of goes even further. It goes into the domain of what's called generative design, where you have some structure and you ask a computer to optimize it for something. And each of these structures is optimized for some different property. It could be the load that it needs to bear. It could be, in the case of our, our med chips, it can be the release rate of different drugs over time. Uh, and so no, there's no one solution. There's no one killer application. I think that's kind of the point of, of, of a lot of platforms, is that the platform is a killer application because everybody else can build their own personal killer applications on top of it. In the case of hardware, they can literally build them. Uh, and so I just want to close by saying that it's these, these new platforms that enable these new innovations. And it's, it's kind of a, a virtuous cycle where we have a technology, we have a 3D printer, we have a laser cutter, we have a computerized milling machine, and it's capable of doing some range of things that are largely based upon how it can move around through space. And lots of people have figured out lots of creative ways to take these machines and make very interesting structures and physical goods and materials with them. And now we're kind of entering a new phase where the feedback loop comes around to the other side and we say, okay, we have gotten, you know, we've advanced pretty far with the tools we have. How can we adapt these machines and devices to create a new generation of, of products on top of them? And this is even where bioprinting came from. 3D printing is almost 45 years old now. Um, and bioprinting came in kind of the, the second generation of applications where people said, hey, in addition to the, the plastics that these printers are squirting out, what if we put cells inside of them? What if we put materials that were safe to use in the body? And that's where BioSapiens applications are coming from. Um, and there's all kinds of other applications. This is actually an example of, of 3D printing uh, a glass vase um, with a specially designed printer from MIT. And this came about because people said, all right, we've got this printing platform. It does this, ac this action, but our materials are limited. Can we use the same motion gantry and put a different end effector that lets us use glass? And they figured out how to do that. And this, this cycle will repeat. People are going to figure out all kinds of crazy optics and artistic things to do with this glass printing. And that feedback from the community is going to go back in to the industry and the people who are making these new hardware platforms to manufacture devices, and there'll be another generation. And so it's, it's, in some ways, it's harder to build on these kinds of platforms because you need to be there. Um, you can't just be anywhere and working on a laptop. Uh, you need to be in, in a shop or you need to be in, in a lab. But in, in other ways, I think the, the feedback loop is even stronger because it's this this is our tool, this is what we can do with that tool, we need a new tool, and you, you keep modifying. So it's, it's, it, the whole process is generative, and both 
the, the machine and the things that are being made on the machine can be platforms because the feedstock and the whole system is so extensible. Uh, and so with that, I just want to acknowledge the other two members of the team. Uh, Katija, who is the CEO and, and founder, she actually came up with the idea. She's a, a surgeon from Princeton. Uh, Abbas, our director of communications, and they're both actually over in London right now at the Rebel Bio Accelerator program. So I'm, I'm here with the printer actually making little chips and, and testing them out, and they're, they're doing business stuff. Um, but thank you very much. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll take a few questions now. And I'll be around during lunch also. One question. Yes. I have a really quick question. So what is the estimated time to market of your product? Hi. Um, I just have a kind of simple question. What is the estimated time to market of your products and, and maybe uh, estimated cost? Sure. So I, did, I didn't want to get too much into regulatory because I could give a whole other presentation on the intricacies of the FDA. What we're planning to do right now is uh, a pathway called 505B2, which is for, covers these materials that are all kind of pre-approved because they've existed in other products and are being kind of re repackaged. Ideally, if, if the, the FDA says the, the case we're putting together about this repackaging, if, that, if they buy that, um, and by the preliminary data we'll be presenting as part of that case. It would be approximately a four to five year span to get to market and approximately three to five million dollars of, of capital to get it there. Uh, think if the FDA for some reason doesn't like that repackaging, things get a little more exciting, but we can, we can talk about that at lunch. Awesome, thank you.